Not this time. No, not this time. It's totally made up. Pure fiction. We're not talking about this or this. We're talking about this. Hi, this is Pat Schoff, and uh, this is Making Space. Uh, today we're going to be talking about maintenance of a printer lab, a fabrication lab, and what you typically have to do. Now, I debated how to do this, um, you know, 30 years in sales and doing presentations. People really don't want to see a picture of me talking. That's more of a classroom lecture. <clears throat> the, the material, the, the text, the pictures are, are more important than watching me. So I'm going to do this as I would a presentation and have a conversation. So when you talk about maintenance for 3D printers, we're specifically going to talk about the uh, MK2, MK3 Prusa 3D printer because that's what the lab that I belong to has. <clears throat> and I interviewed the uh, manager of the fabrication lab and had a discussion about what they typically do. So there's a lot of things that have to happen, a lot of maintenance schedules. And the question is, how often do you do it? Um, <clears throat> tuning and maintenance, what do you do when you do it? And then what parts fail? And, and what other things do you have to consider? What random things like uh, hardware and firmware upgrades? So if you look at how often you should work on a printer, in some websites say 100 hours of printing, then you should go maintain the computer. Others do it on days. It's like an oil change. Um, you know, the, the number of days ranges from 30 to 60. And then you can just wait until something fails. When printers prints start to get corrupted or out of alignment, um, go fix it then. So as a lab manager, you typically don't want to wait until something fails because you don't know that it fails unless you're in the lab all the time. Uh, doing a set schedule is probably the best thing. Uh, I talked to the TXRX lab manager for the fabrication lab, and he said on average one hour per printer per week is what they do, and he tries to keep six printers um, up and active, so that means one full day of maintenance a week um, based on the number of printers they've got in the lab. And the things they typically do are cleaning, dusting, and wiping to get dust off the surface areas. Lubrication of the shaft. Not necessarily every week, but, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to make sure it's lubricated every other week, every month. Uh, making sure the nozzle's clean. Making sure that the heating bed and heating element are uh, clear and, and not corrupted. And then bed leveling. Just run some simple diagnostic tests and, and, and see how things work. Uh, there is a good YouTube video um, that goes through and talks about um, how to tune a printer and uh, different things that you should do on a regular basis. So one of the things that um, I, I was curious about is bed leveling. Um, in some printers, you've got screws that you can go in and tweak and tune. Others, they have electronic adjustments. Uh, the Prusa has both, where I can go in and tweak and tune whether a corner's up, a corner's down. Um, I've got some uh, tests that I can run to see how things are laid out. And then if I don't feel like going in and tweaking it with a screwdriver, I can tweak it electronically. So there is a menu in, in the uh, tuning system that allows me to go into the settings and pull up the rear side or pull up the right side or push down the left side. And, and I can adjust it appropriately and not have to constantly mess with the um, the tools to get things level. Now, typically in an, an active active shop, you want to do this electronically because people will lean against the beds. They will put heavy things on a corner um, and it'll knock it out of alignment. And having to do realignment with the screwdriver on a weekly basis gets cumbersome and difficult. So being able to electronically adjust things really helps. Now, there is a nine-point test that you can do with a Prusa printer, um, and it's basically going into the, um, the settings and, and tell it to go, go print a, a nine-point test, and it'll do a grid pattern and print nine squares around the uh, print bed. Now, the idea is you want to be able to look at it and see if every corner is printing appropriately, if every edge is printing appropriately, and if the middle is printing appropriately. 
And if it is, then great. If not, then I need to do an adjustment either on the print bed or on the z-axis because the, there could be a slight gap at one corner and I might need to raise the left corner, left front corner. Uh, there might be a gap all around and I need to change the, the Z alignment. So I can go in and adjust the Z up and down as it's running and as a default so that I can make on the fly adjustments. Now, some of the things that, the, that are typically looked at is, you know, first, are any of the sensors disconnected or are cables broken? And the um, the sensor that measures the height off of the table, I believe it's called the PENDA, uh, P-E-N-D-A, or P-I-N-D-A, um, is what typically gets worn down and broken. Yeah, the PENDA probe. Um, and, and that's what is usually the fault uh, of a sensor that's going to fail. Cables get broken. Usually it's the thermistor cable, the temperature sensor cable that comes into the hot element. Um, the cable is underrated, and since it's next to something hot, it gets worn, it gets moved, and as a hot cable gets moved, it tends to get brittle. The plastic heats and cools, heats and cools, heats and cools, and crumbles, but the metal inside fatigues as well. So the thermistor is probably the next thing that's going to break, um, in that the cable going into the thermistor is uh, what is is not the most robust part of the design. And um, the only way to really fix that is to swap it out. Um, other things to look at are debris on the nozzle or on the uh, build plate because they're sometimes pitting if the nozzle drives into the build plate or if it runs into an existing print that peeled up, the plastic will wrap around the nozzle and super cook on it and you have to scrape it off because it, it um, gets a little too um, a little too baked on the nozzle. Um, sensors triggering too high, uh, you know, the z-axis is uh, something that uh, you typically need to look at and that's that can be done pretty easily. Um, if I drive the z-axis all the way to the top, notice there's no gap between the top of the bed and the top of the rail. Whereas on the on the right side, I went the wrong way. Uh, on the right side, there's a gap. Uh, so notice there's it didn't drive it all the way to the stop. What that means is the left side of the bed is higher than the right side of the bed. And the way you correct that is you drive the z-axis all the way to the top and continue driving it to the top because the right motor will continue to turn and the left motor will skip. So eventually both will be in alignment, both will be at the top axis, at the top point with no gap, and at that point it'll work perfectly fine. Now what you'll see when you do something like that is on the left side you're going to see striping on the three points that are on the left side of the print bed because the head is too high, and on the right side you might see striation because the print bed's too low. Since there's a gap here, that means that on the right-hand side, so over here on these three test points, you're going to see the low characteristic, and on the left-hand side, you're going to see the high characteristic, where it's stringy because the, um, <clears throat> the uh, print is actually dribbling down onto the deck as opposed to um, going onto the surface. So in the case where it's too high, you're squeezing out into air and you're getting a big fat round blob that's coming out. When we're too low, we're squeezing it and we're getting skips. So you see the striation or nothing coming out because we're way too low and nothing can be squeezed out of the nozzle. Now what you'd like is the nozzle to be the fixed distance away and that's hard to do across the whole whole print bed, but you know the idea is if I can tune everything correctly, that's what's going to happen. Now, the first layer calibration is a way of looking at this. So the printer goes to the back left corner, it paints a line across, comes down, paints a line back across, and I should feel a nice layered effect. So what I should feel is something that's about this thick. And if I'm rubbing my finger across it and there's barely anything there, it's a very thin line, I'm too close. And if it's too bumpy, it's too large and round, it's going to feel twice the size. So, you know, whether it's halfway between these two or halfway between these two, 
that's hard to judge. But it's easy to judge between it's too fat and too thin because you'll see it. And then the lines going across the bed, that's going to test your Z uh, because it draws the line all the way across. It should be a continuous line and not change in, in thickness as it goes across. And then as it where brings down towards the front of the bed, that's going to test the Y axis to show you that it actually is working properly. And then the final is it prints a little square in the right hand side or bottom left hand side so that I can test striations and, and see if it's too thick, too thin in general when I do multiple layers and multiple strips. So if I look at a at the nozzle and it's corroded and has baked on stuff all over it, that needs to be scraped off. Now typically what I can do is get a wire brush and scrape it um, and just scratch it clean because this is just kind of cooked on material. And since it is a brass nozzle, I can scrape it and scratch it. But notice this nozzle, it should be a very small hole extended out, whereas this one's gotten worn down. It's a much bigger hole. It's going to extrude more plastic than it should. So the plastic is going to come out quicker and easier because the hole is larger. And I don't necessarily want that. What I'd like is to have a small hole. So you have to look at not only is it caked on, is it coated, but is the hole the uniform size or is it charred or pitted or oblong? Because what I'd like to have is a nice clean one. Now, this is actually easy to change out in that all I have to do is put a nut or a wrench on the um, on the on the nozzle and unscrew it and put another uh, uh, wrench on the heater block. And as I twist the 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 nozzle out, um, it it comes out as I spin it clockwise. Now, when I spin it counterclockwise, it locks it back in and it puts it back into the heater block. And then I can go through and calibrate again. Now, the important thing to remember is I really don't want to change out the hot end unless I have to. Uh, what I'd like to do is just change out the nozzle. Now, if I have to change out the hot end, because sometimes I do get um, filament coming down through this whole channel and it crystallizes inside the hot end. And that typically happens when somebody's using a, an unusual type of, of filament, something that's got some uh, extra characteristics in it that you don't want used. And to be honest, in an open shop, in an open lab, you really don't have control over what material people put in. You can suggest things, you can recommend things, you can spot check things, but somebody's going to put some old crummy filament in there that's got got impurities, and the impurities are going to cook inside of the, um, the hot end. Now, the thermistor that's inside the uh, hot block, these cables right here are typically weak, and you can't change out the cables without changing out the whole thermistor. So <clears throat> you could put some tubing on this, put some wrap, or put something to thermally isolate this just a little bit, but it does come in contact, very close to contact, to the heater block, so it's going to get hot. There's not much you can do about that. Uh, recommendation is just keep a supply of thermistors um, in your in your locker, in a cab <laughs> in a cabinet, in a drawer, so that uh, it can be swapped out pretty easy. Now, for that, I typically have to swap out the either just the thermistor or the whole hot end. And when I'm putting the hot end back in, I need to make sure I get it all the way up. I don't want a gap in here, and I have to make sure it lines up properly all the way. So usually I, I, I typically heat up the, the, the extruder to the highest temperature possible for like a PETG, <coughs> and then from there jam something through that it can withstand the high temperature and try to feed it. If it won't feed, if it's not coming clean, you're going to have to change this out. Now, I can try to force a, a, a cleaning bristle through, kind of like a pipe, a pipe cleaner type thing. Um, but messing with the hot ends that and jamming metal into a hot end is going to get whatever you jam in hot. And uh, I personally don't like messing with something that's about 200 degrees millimeters from my hand. So. Swapping it out is an idea. Uh, trying to brush it out is an idea. If I can get something clean through it, then great. If I can't, swap it out. 
Now, if I am going to do a swap out, I also want to look at the gear mechanism. Now, notice here the gear mechanism, and this is the teeth that pull the filament from the top end into the hot end. So this hole right here, this blue hole, is the, the top of the hot end, and this is where the filament feeds through the top of the cavity. This gear should line up exactly right there. So in this picture, it's too far to the left. So what I need to do is I need to loosen the set screws that are holding the, um, the gears in because there's an Allen wrench that tightens and loosens this on the shaft. I loosen it up the Allen wrench. I slide it out. After I slide it out, I tighten it back up and the gear is clean and should be working. Now, as far as standard lubrication, <clears throat> a little uh, white, uh, white grease to put on the rod, and then you slide the, um, slide the motors back and forth so that it self-lubricates the bearings. Uh, to be honest, the bearings is the most critical part of this. The rod usually doesn't get damaged, doesn't get dent. Uh, the, the tension arms, the, um, the belts typically don't get loosened. Uh, it's not the belt that loosens, it's the hold point on the ends and the tensioners that cause it to loosen up. So if I'm seeing things like moving along the x-axis and it's each layer is shifted just a little bit, that says that either the tension is loose because it's not moving fast enough or the the uh, the rod needs lubricated. So usually every other week uh, these rods are lubricated. Uh, the uh, feeder assembly is opened up and a brush is used against the gears that feed the gear that feed the filament into the hot end. And then lubrication on the gear mechanism, not the teeth mechanism, to make sure it moves smoothly and doesn't get caught. Um, typically, if I've got filament that goes thicker, thinner, thicker, thinner. Sometimes it uh, fibers come loose or bits come loose and get stuck into this mechanism. So cleaning the gears, cleaning the teeth is uh, a monthly thing that should be done, not a uh, daily or weekly thing. Now to test the tension, there are a few points that need to be tested. Um, on the uh, z-axis, the, the tensioners are at the very top. I can tighten the, oh, I'm sorry, this is the, um, the y-axis, uh, or the z x-axis. Uh, I can loosen these two nuts, and then there's a Allen wrench head that tightens up to tighten this belt going across uh, across the horizon. I also have... Tightening points, I believe there are five, there should be another one here, that tightens the bearings onto the rod to make sure it works. And then I want to make sure that the Z-axis belt has a tightener as well. And I can make, raise that or lower that just a hair so that it pulls a little bit tighter. Now, usually these aren't the things that get loose. Um, what typically gets loose is the x-axis. Now, the x-axis typically gets loose because it's at the bottom of the printer. Um, it's a plastic piece that's holding everything, whereas everything else is a fairly rigid piece. And this plastic gets worn. You know, maybe not every week, maybe not every month, but long term, it stretches in this direction. So it gets a little looser and this belt loosens up because this part gets fatigued just a little bit. Um, initially, the uh, MK2s had, uh, this part was printed in PLA, and then it got upgraded to PETG. Um, if you're really worried about this, or if you're expecting to run long-term, long hours, or long duration in a lab, um, go buy an aluminum uh, bracket and put the aluminum bracket in place of the plastic bracket. Um, this is probably the single strongest failure point um, on the printer, uh, and the MK2 and the MK3 have similar issues and similar problems. Now, the one thing that does fail isn't necessarily the tensioner, it's the bearings. Uh, the uh, bearings that run along the rod for the X direction um, have a lot of stress on them. 
So as the, the printhead is moving back and forth, it torques a bit. Um, if I'm digging into the bed or if I'm hitting against things, it torques those bearings a little bit and the bearings do wear out. So the tensioner is not the issue. It's the, um, uh, the jamming on the x-axis that's typically causing problems. Now, two things to fix this. One is lubricate frequently. Make sure things are, are lubricated and working and it's a smooth transition. You can't really prohibit things from getting jammed or knocked or, or digging into the bed. You can monitor it, but somebody changes the setting and then prints for a while or something peels up and it jams into the head. It's going to stress these bearings in an axis so that it shouldn't be stressed. Now, fortunately, it's easy to replace these. Um, it's a design where I can slide it in, slide it out, and put new bearings in. So again, keep bearings in supply, keep things in a, in a toolbox, in a, in a shelf, so that you can go and replace these parts once a year, every few months. <clears throat> now, temperature is an issue. Temperature is a huge issue for a lot of these printers. Um, calibration is important to do and thermal runaway is something you really have to look out for. So for thermal runaway, typically what's done is you get a silicon heater block that covers the nozzle and the heater block because the fan that's on the printer blows back onto the heater and to, on the nozzle to cool the element on the table. Now, if the element on the table is like a scoop, the air coming through gets pushed back up into the nozzle and back up into the heater block and the fan cools down the heat assembly quicker than it needs to. So there are two things I can do. One is I can reduce the fan speed because if I'm moving further up and I'm scooping air up based on the profile that I'm printing, I can reduce the fan speed. The second is I put a thermal block around it to prevent the, the heat from coming up. Uh, the other thing you need to look at is, is the bed heating properly. Um, it has heaters in different areas. It's a, a sheet steel, so it should heat uniformly. It doesn't necessarily, it's not like cast iron where you heat a corner of cast iron and all of the cast iron gets hot. Steel has hot and cold areas, so that if you did a infrared scan of the bed, you'd see a photo like on the top right and notice that there are some cool spots in the center of the bed and in the corners of the bed, and there's really not much you can do about that. Um, so in, in theory, I can raise the bed of the temperature to get that center part hotter, but that also gets the areas on the edge hotter than it needs to be. So you have to look out for superheating and supercooling and delta variations between the two. <clears throat> Speaking of temperatures, um, temperature affects a lot of different things. So if I'm printing a square block, notice on this, on the far right hand side, notice how it's thicker right there at the corner, right along this edge, because this was at the bottom of the print. So in this picture, it's a very square, very hard edge. In reality, the bottom gets stacked uh, because the first few passes are typically hotter than the, the other passes, and it melts and squishes as it goes through. I can do a temperature test, and Prusa has on their website a temperature test that I could run <coughs> and print this as a test. It takes about 10 minutes to print the whole thing. But the G-code has variations in that it prints, and then it prints at 190 degrees, and then it moves up and then it goes to 195. So I don't need to mess with this. They provide you the G-code on how to do this. Um, with the cube, the, the thing that I typically want to do is I want to print the cube, get out a caliper, and make sure in all three dimensions that it's the proper thickness. So if I expect a 20 millimeter cube, I'm getting 19 millimeters in the X direction. That says that the stepper motor that's pulling in the X direction is not pulling far enough for each transition step. So I need to go into the software, I need to tweak it a little bit, and the idea is I'm going to move it more each step and actually go 20 centimeters when I say go 20 centimeters. 
and not go 19 centimeters when I tell it to go 20. So I can tweak and tune the stepper motor settings. Um, that does require I go in and do some command lines, which the video, um, the YouTube video in, in this link here goes in and details how to set it, how to, how to go in and reprogram it, and how to recalibrate based on the settings of this um, XYZ cube. Now, the boat is typically kind of a hard test. It does a few things. One is the hard edges up here. Another is stringing between the boathouse and the top of the boat. And then the third is the curvature. Does it curve smoothly or does it striate part of the way through? And then once I get everything printed properly based on the orientation, I might get a lot of cooling here and very poor cooling back here because cooling is not symmetrical on the Prusa printers. And this, this test gives me a lot of structures that lets me see cooling in, in three dimensions as opposed to is the fan cooling the front part as it prints, but not the back part. So I might see really good smooth edges here and really rough edges on the back side of this cabin. So various tests I can do. All of these are available on the Prusa website or Thingiverse, so I can go download them. I recommend for the temperature tower, go and pull down the G-code. Don't pull down the... Um, uh, don't pull down the design file. Um, go to the link for the Prusa printers, and they give you the, um, the the temperature tower code ready to print. So some of the failures that you could see, uh, filament is a, is kind of a, a mixed bag. There's not much you can do about filaments. Um, <clears throat> And if they're the labs, then you can control it. If they're other individuals, you can't. Um, old and moist filament typically breaks. So what you'll get is in the middle of a job, and it'll just snap. And the Prusa printers have uh, a snap detection, so they'll stop the print so you don't get a big old hairball of uh, filament because it's still printing even though, or I'm sorry, it doesn't overheat because the uh, filament stopped feeding. Um, the other things that could fail, typically you do not see the power supply fail. Typically you don't see the hot end fail, but you do see the thermistor fail. The nozzle, uh, usually it's just regular cleaning is no big deal. Uh, damaged bed uh, with the uh, Mark III with the magnetic um, sheet, um, it, it typically doesn't get damaged as much, but I can swap them out pretty easy. On the Mark II, it's a steel bed. I have to unscrew everything and swap it out. So damaged beds are a real problem with uh, the Mark II, but on the Mark III, they're pretty trivial. I just have to have an extra supply of the magnetic plates to slap on and, and play with. That also solves an issue of peeling people's prints off. If I have an extra supply of the uh, magnetic sheets, I then just take it off, put it on a shelf, put another magnetic sheet down. So having extras of those is a good thing as well. That allows people to peel their own prints off the bed. Or if you've run out of them, you peel it off, put the thing on the shelf, which is what we do at TXRX because uh, we're using Mark IIs. Uh, damage cables. Uh, typically, there are three things that can cause damage cables. One is heat. Uh, because the, the thermistor close to it, um, it superheats the cable and causes brittleness. Second is something broke loose, and as the bed moves, the cables flex. If it gets bound on something, like somebody put a screwdriver or a large object in the back of a printer, if it slams into it, it could damage the cable. It could snap the cable, stretch the cable, uh, pinch the cable, do something. Uh, bearings and tension brackets are typical things that um, fail, and we talked about that earlier, so I'm not going to go into depth on it again. And then the electronics, the controller and the uh, touchpad. Usually those don't fail unless somebody just is careless, and sometimes you do have to reprint the 3D part that's holding the LED display and the uh, scroll wheel. But uh, usually those are gross failures as opposed to normal wear and tear failures. Now, the beautiful thing is almost everything on the Prusa printer can be swapped out. It's a kit. Everything can be 3D printed or ordered. Um, if it's an aluminum part, it can be ordered. If it's a um, 
a casing, a housing. It can be 3D printed. Uh, if you're going to print, I recommend using PETG because it's uh, stronger and it will it will wear and tear more. So just realize all parts are replaceable. So if something breaks, there's a module that can be replaced or a part that can be replaced. About the only thing you really can't get into and replace is the power supply. You replace the whole power supply. You don't replace subcomponents of the power supply. Uh, you get into some danger there with uh, capacitance and, and voltage. So usually that's not a fault point. Those are pretty reliable systems. Now, as far as firmware, um, there are regular upgrades on a regular basis. So you have to go to the Prusa website, look at it. Usually you'll get an email because you're part of a subscription, and that email will tell you, hey, it's time for an upgrade and here are the features. And almost always I have to go change the slicer because I have new drivers, I have new features, I have new functions in the slicer that uh, can talk to the printer and do certain things. These are usually once or twice a year. Um, once a year is, is kind of a norm, so I wouldn't worry about this too much. Just make sure you get all of your printers on the same firmware. Um, having an unusual printer that doesn't have a menu option is frustrating, and nobody will use that printer. And if they use it, they'll misuse it, and it'll break easier. So in review, the final things we talked about, <clears throat> maintenance schedule, how often. Uh, rule of thumb is one hour per printer per month. Or, I'm sorry, one hour per printer per week. Uh, and usually it's cleaning and lubrication and making sure the nozzle is the right distance away from the bed. Um, the, 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 the height pin, the, um, the sensor is what will, will wear and fail. And as that goes across the bed, if it's out of alignment, if it's a little off, as the nozzle goes down, it might rub against stuff, and it's a soft metal. So um, as it rubs against stuff, that Pindo system will get thinner and thinner and thinner, and you'll have to adjust it down. So that's not necessarily a weekly thing. That's more of a monthly thing, uh, unless you're running it 7 by 24, and then it's a weekly thing. Um, making sure that the belts and, and uh, screws are all tight, making sure that the temperature is good, doing a quick test print. The uh, cube takes about 10 minutes. The, um, the first level takes about two or three minutes. Uh, the boat can take about 10 minutes. So doing various tests just to make sure everything's in alignment and all the settings are done is a good thing to do on a Saturday or if Saturday's your busiest time, then you do it on a Friday. Uh, and just make sure that uh, everything's set up. The parts that could fail, failures are, are pretty rare, um, but you know, make sure you've got extra nozzles, extra hot ends, extra thermistors, uh, because those are the things that are probably gonna fail. And then print some extra 3D parts. Uh, it's, all, it's a very good thing to do is if you're gonna teach a class, have the class print some of the 3D parts if people don't have ideas. So tell them this is what we use for this. Let's go print it with this material and use it as a teaching lesson. And then firmware hardware upgrades are always something you have to look at. So hopefully this gave you a good idea of things that need to be looked at from a lab perspective, um, things that have broken in the, uh, the lab in Houston that I belong to, and things that um, if you're going to start up your own lab, what you need to look out for. So if I've missed something, if I commented wrong, if I misspoke something, tell me in the comments. I am more than happy to take feedback on, hey, you forgot about, or we don't really lubricate once a week, we lubricate every three months. So let me know. And then what materials you use for lubrication and what materials you use to print 3D parts with. If you use something different than PETG, it'd be nice to know. So thanks, and I hope this was helpful.
Now back to your regularly scheduled program. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do.